In this presentation, I'm going to talk about uh, edge intelligence. We will understand um, most of uh, edge devices, because they have a limited computational power. They cannot run intensive computation. So they have to uh, rely on some kind of uh, knowledge transfer. Right. So naturally, uh, that requires a collaborative learning. That's the main theme of this talk. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. OK, so I'll start with the big picture, and then I'll present you collaborative learning from two perspectives. First, collaborative learning between edge, yeah. between edge and the cloud, for which we have developed the framework we call the distribution now, robust optimization framework. And then I talk about collab collaborative learning uh, across edge nodes. Okay. All right. <coughs> so here's the big picture. Um, over the past decade, there's a lot of talking about uh, smart things, smart IoT, smart Internet of Things. So um, back in 2008, 2009, because of the energy crisis at that time, uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in smart grid, smart energy. Okay. And then in 2012, 2013, that time frame, uh, the interest shifted to smart city, smart highway. And more recently, there's a lot of talking about uh, <coughs> smart buildings, smart factory, just uh, you know, over the past two or three years. And uh, I was uh, doing some reading on this. I was uh, actually amazed by how much uh, energy buildings consume. So in the energy sector, right, how much energy, you take a guess, how much energy buildings consume? What percentage? 40%. You knew it? Yeah, I was surprised. I thought it's okay. 15%, 20%. That's 40% of total energy. It's just uh, shocking to me. Uh, yeah. So that's why it explains why there's a lot of interest in that. Okay. So, uh, as Hamid mentioned, uh, back in 2015, I joined this race. You know, smart things. I also started something called a, a company called Smartplier. That's the startup, right? Co-founded, and the smart reply is a marriage of two words, smart and which other word do you? Take a guess. Market. You got it. Yeah, smart reply. Yeah, smart reply. Huh? So, uh, long story short, so you know, back in 2015, the main motivation was to edge computing. That time was still very early. Okay. Uh, so our main our main motivation was to develop some capabilities for edge computing. Uh, including video analytics, including like a data thinning, and the only transmit data necessary to the cloud from the edge to the cloud, right? And try to make a local intelligent local decisions. <coughs> and for that, we also uh, uh, developed SDK to connect devices in the proximity, right? To make them connected and share resources. So we had uh, developed functionalities, including. Bandwidth bounding, node balancing, failover. Okay, so initially, initially we wanted just to build the software uh, stack, but we couldn't find the, the, the device to install the software, so we had to build the hardware. So we ended up building this um, edge gateway, so this is the box, and uh, this de this device, in fact, has this edge gateway is being well received. Uh, in fact, we recent, recently we built a partnership with Amazon. They put our product in their category, the green grass category. Okay, so long story short, let's come back to the big picture. Okay, if I look at this picture, right, there are many smart things, like smart hospital, smart factory, smart buildings. They all reside at network edge, <coughs> right? Each of them is an independent system and has its own network. They, also, they are also connected to the cloud <coughs> and receive services from the cloud. Right. Okay. So with abstraction, we can view the IoT, this IoT ecosystem as a continuum from the cloud to edge or from edge to cloud. So future communications would be from 
edge to edge go through the cloud. And they always see services from the cloud, but the feature communication would be from edge to edge. And uh, another feature is that communication and uh, computing would be intertwined, would be indistinguishable. Okay, and this is part of the 5G standards, computing and the communication. Uh, really uh, indistinguishable. All right, so, okay, we talk about the edge and there are many edges. How many edges are there? And there are tons of them. Depending on the latency, we can categorize uh, edges right, into different uh, classes. So if we look at the latency, we can classify them into like, a, in the first category is like one to <coughs> 20 milliseconds. It's a very stringent latency requirement. And the next category is 20 to 80 milliseconds, 80 to 550. So we really <coughs> are interested in this category, the first category, which is a very stringent latency requirement. Right? And um, many of you have heard about uh, some outstanding applications in this category, right? such as autonomous driving. For a car, right, it has to make decision right, right here, right now. Right? If uh, the latency is beyond a few milliseconds, accident may happen. And this can be a disaster. Okay. Another outstanding application is so-called uh, augmented reality. Right. So this is, uh, if the latency is greater than, the study show, if the latency is greater than 20 milliseconds, the human, humans would uh, have dizziness. Right. So that put a very strict requirement on the latency. Okay, so there are many words, many uh, smart IoT things uh, out there. We just talked about autonomous driving. We talked about augmented reality. The IoT, smart IoT also finds application in precision manufacturing in robotics. Right? This is the Boston Dynamics Company. And recently, I, I saw a video clip. The Boston uh, the robots actually can do yoga. It's very interesting. Yeah. All right, so, okay, uh, a fundamental question here is how can we make IoT, Internet of Things, smart? What's your guess? How do we do it? How, what's your take on this? So we have to train it, making them smart, right? To make them smart, we have to train it, but how do we train it? We need the data. Okay, so data, I just want to share with you some numbers to give you a more concrete idea. Data. From the, civil, in the dawn of civilization, that's like 5,000 years or so right, ago, to the year 2003, human beings as a whole generated uh, five exabytes of data. Five exabytes. So what, what is exabyte? Why well, exabyte is 10 to 18? So it's a huge, huge number, 10 to 18. Okay. Now, a recent report tells us in, by year 2021, like in two or three years, <coughs> the cloud would uh, have generated or have generated 20.6 zettabyte. So one zettabyte is 1,000 exabyte. So you just do a quick calculation, the quick math tells us this is like 4,000 times more. <coughs> so over from a year 2003 to 2021, 18 years. The amount of data generated right, over these 18 years would be like 4,000 times over that amount over 5,000 years. That's really amazing. What is more shocking to me is that, oops, yeah, yeah. So the edge devices is going to, they're going to generate how much more data? Right? 850 zero, but 42 times more. Why? Because the number of edge devices is growing so quickly. It's predicted that the number of edge devices is going to grow like, a, I think it's around like 500 billion edge devices in 2025, by 2025. Yeah. So, so that's why people call it like a tsunami of data. Data tsunami. And uh, there was an article by, you know, one of these, uh, like a Wall Street article. Uh, uh, articles. It's predicted as the data itself, tsunami of data, could uh, consume 20% of global electricity by 2025. 20%. 20 just data. 
It's uh, amazing. <coughs> so the point here is that the data volume is just the sheer volume is just uh, explosive, right? It's growing, has been growing <coughs> more than exponentially. It's growing explosively. So if we had to transmit this data back in the cloud, this is not feasible, right? There's no such infrastructure there, and somebody also has to pay for that. This is not feasible. Uh, plus, many of the, these applications require, we just talked about latency requirement. Many of these applications require real-time edge intelligence. They need decision making right here, right now. Okay, so you, if you transmit, have to transmit data back in the cloud, and right? there's no guarantee about uh, delay and latency. So I think that's the key. Yeah. So the combination of the two, right, you know, make us think of what is the solution. Right? Uh, so a general consensus is that uh, you know we need to push services from the core, from the cloud push as much as much as possible to network edge, okay, in the, in the physical proximity. <coughs> and uh, how do you do that? We need to combine edge computing and uh, machine learning. So let's, okay, quickly <coughs> summarize, right? What's the, what are the benefits of edge computing? I just talked about latency, low latency, high bandwidth, and the energy is energy efficient, and there is also a more, uh, suitable for privacy, privacy protection. That's another area I've been working on. All right. Okay, so it's our belief that the, you know, the marriage of the two, edge computing and uh, machine learning AI, would give us edge intelligence. Okay. So we have this uh, you know, analogy. So if we regard AI as a superstar, like in the Tom Brady in New England, Right. <coughs> and the edge community is the rising star. And then the team work by the two, right, that would give us a uh, championship. Some of you may not like Tom, Tom Brady, but uh, <laughs> the fact is that uh, uh, New England, the Patriots, right, they won Super Bowl twice in the last three years. Six out of the last 10 years. Amazing. <coughs> <Yeah. coughs> I know some of you may like uh, football or soccer, right? <laughs> this is another analogy. Right? So maybe if you follow soccer, you wouldn't know who these people are. These two people. <coughs> well, I don't, uh, this is, uh, if you are French, you wouldn't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, okay, so that's the big picture. Uh, um, so we want to get, we are having edge in the <coughs> And uh, uh, I spent some time uh, in, in a startup. We worked on practical solutions. But they are, you know, they <coughs> lesson we learn is there's no, it's, an, it's very little sort of like a, uh, theoretical guidance, theoretical foundation. So over the past two years, we've been trying to develop some uh, systematic understanding of this. So I first present you a collaborative learning between edge and the cloud. So for that, we, so we are going to talk about uh, distribution now, robust optimization. Okay. So we just talk about the why and how, right? So most of the IoT devices, right, the created data have to, will have to be stored, processed, and analyzed at the edge of the network to achieve real-time edge intelligence. All right. <coughs> so, <coughs> so in general, in general, the learning problem can be cast as a, you try to minimize some kind of cost function or loss function, right? Okay. So the cost function here can be, we start with <laughs> convex, but it can be generalized to more complicated case. Okay. So H is the cost function, and uh, it depends on data. Let's <coughs> right. C is the data, and uh, W is the decision variable, or your model parameter. That's something you are trying to learn, you are trying to learn, right? And uh, the data follows some model, right, some distribution. Okay, <coughs> all right, so you try to figure this out, try to learn the model. Okay, so how do we know this uh, P, right, this probability distribution of the data, in principle, we can compute it. Even though it's high dimensional, in principle, we can write it as a multi high dimensional integral, we can, in principle, we can compute it. But the reality is that in many practical applications, we don't know it. 
We don't know the underlying model probability distribution for the data. Instead, we only have some samples. Okay? All right. So, in existing approaches, data driven approaches, you know, the sample average approximation is one, of the one, is the one of the approaches used very often. So, the idea is very intuitive. <coughs> you have the cost function, right, which depends on the data points. So, for each data point, you can write the cost function as this, right? And then you take sample average. Okay. But you see, this depends on, you try to minimize the over W, so the computational complexity and convergence become the main, main, main hurdles. All right? Another approach is so-called a robust optimization. <coughs> okay. So the idea behind this approach is also very, very uh, straightforward. Okay, so there are many data points. You can see I, okay, suppose they are in this uh, set. And then we look at the worst case, the worst case cost function, right, point-wise. And then you try to minimize the worst <coughs> case, point-wise worst case. That's, a robot, that's the basic idea <coughs> behind robust optimization. I sometimes the <laughs> microphone may not be maybe too low. Okay. All right, okay. <coughs> so the point here is that this approach, well, based on robust optimization, can be extremely conservative because it looks at the worst case <coughs> performance. So more recently, there's a new approach, study I think around 2010 or so, studied by OR folks, Open Research folks at Stanford. So they developed this data-driven <coughs> distributional robust optimization approach. So the idea is, uh, so Build upon this point-wise robust optimization. <coughs> Instead of looking at point-wise, then look at distribution-wise. Okay. So how do you do it? So based on data samples, they data sample gave us, gave us some kind of distribution idea about distribution, and then they construct an uncertainty set, uncertainty set of distributions. So in the, in the uncertainty set, each of them is a distribution. For each of the po each of the distribution in the uncertainty set. And then you, look, you can compute an expectation, right? So you look at this uncertainty set, the worst case, okay, in the uncertainty set, but you look at the expected cost function for the, you know, this is a distribution wise, okay, worst case among the uncertainty set. Make sense? <coughs> so you have distribution to start with, and then now you build the uncertainty set. Each for each uh, case in the uncertainty set is a distribution. Right. For each of them, you can compute expected cost. And then you look at the worst case in this entity set. This is so-called distributional robust optimization. So compared in a point-wise, this is much more sensible, right? It's not as conservative, it's more than conservative. In fact, it subsumes the conventional robust optimization in the, in the degenerate, degenerate case. Okay. Okay, so so we want to construct an set uh, of distributions. And then the natural question, the natural question here is, uh, how do you quantify the distance between distributions? Okay. Uh, here we, you know, in this uh, study, we use uh, the Wasser stand distance. Okay, this is so-called a counterbridge, open stand metric. Okay. <coughs> so the idea is that, because we're talking about distributions, so in a distribution functional space, you look at each point. Each point is a distribution. You pick two points. Two. That means you pick two distributions, P1, P2. You only quantify the distance, the OSSN distance. Which this is defined as, uh, so, you, so okay, for each point, okay, you, there's a distance between, there's a cost between these, t these two points, right? Okay. Um, so uh, you choose a path from P1 to P2, right? There is a corresponding cost. The cost can be written as uh, the integral, right, of the cost function over this path. And the path would depend, would depend on the joint model between, basically <coughs> between P1 and P2. So look at the functional space, right, P1, P2. Okay, you take a one, you take a, one po a, mass, a unit mass 
from P1 to P2. There's a, depending on which part, there's a corresponding cost. The cost would, can be written as this integral, all right? And uh, what's the same distance is the minimum cost. It's the lowest cost. You need to find the optimal. In other words, you need to find the optimal part, okay? So um, this is a so very fundamental tool in so-called optimal transport theory. In fact, this area has seen a few fields medals in the past 10 years. <coughs> okay, all right. So here, you see, it really depends on the joint structure between P1 and P2. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, later. Okay. A, a good thing, a beautiful thing about this metric is that uh, it has, uh, this metric has a beautiful geometric structure. So it's like, a, you know, like, a, you know, you can eat in space, right? You pick a point, you, you, know, you, can, you pick a radius, you can draw a ball around it. So it has very nice property and analogous to that. All right, we'll come back to this. Okay, so come back to the, the edge learning problem. And uh, for the edge devices, the edge devices have a limited data samples, have a limited uh, computational power. So by themselves, they cannot really run, run the intensive computation. Right? So how can they get the edge intelligence in real time? Right? So for that, you know, we don't want to forget in the cloud. We want to make it leverage what we learn in the cloud. The cloud has a lot of computational power, has a lot of data, right? And, uh, and it, can, uh, it, it can learn a lot, right? So the question here is, uh, how do we do the knowledge transfer? Right. And uh, it boils down to how do we model the knowledge transfer and how do we make use of the knowledge transfer. So that's the key question we're going to answer. Okay. We cannot trans 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 transfer the data from the cloud to edge. We cannot do that. We transfer the knowledge. So the question is how can we model, what is a nice way to model and how can we make use of the knowledge transfer here. Okay. So we're going to... Um, Use this approach, DRO, distribution of robust optimization approach, to do that. So intuitively, the knowledge from the cloud, say the, the cloud lens model, lens distribution, for instance, right? <coughs> because the model in the cloud and the model in the at the edge, they are, they are similar but still they are different, right? So the model we learn in the cloud cannot be applicable, 100% applicable to the edge. So when we transfer the knowledge, Say, we, we learn the model, of, we learn the distribution of the data. When we transfer it, right, because the knowledge is not 100% applicable, then we can construct an ambiguity set or uncertainty set around it. And then we, we trans, trans, transfer this uncertainty set to the edge. Okay? So this is the intuition behind this DRA approach. And uh, at the edge, we have data samples. We have limited data samples. Again, we, you know, what, what we learn from just from the local data is not sufficient. So with that, with this intuition, then we can learn something and around it, we can build an uncertainty set. And then we try to build a synergy between the two. So that's the basic idea behind. Let me just illustrate this further. So the cloud, as I said, has a lot of data, a lot of, lots of computational power. Then you can construct it. It really depends on the need. For example, it can construct, can learn the, the data, the model, the distribution, the distribution model of the data, okay? All right? Okay, or you can learn something about, say for, for example, you're doing classification, you can learn something about uh, the conditional model, like label given X, for instance, right? So it really depends on the, the need, and one can construct a distribution uncertainty model. It can be centered around the data distribution, or can be centered, you know, can give you, you know, the prior distribution, right? Can 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 be centered around the prior. This W E is the 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 decision variable at the edge. W C is the decision variable at the, at the in the cloud. Okay, we can then <coughs> construct a set around it. Okay, then because now we have two identity sets, then we can try to build a synergy between the two. Okay. So this is from the edge, this is from the cloud. And then we try to build a synergy between the two uh, for edge learning. So that's the uh, pictorial illustration of the idea behind. Okay, 
So to get a more concrete idea, let me elaborate a bit further. Okay. So there can be different formulations. Okay. Okay. So in one of the formulation, in the first formulation, we can first from based on local data, we can build an empirical model, the edge, can build an empirical model, and then around it, around centered around this uh, empirical model, we can construct the ascent set. And then the knowledge transfer from, from the cloud, again, is uh, in terms of uh, a reference model, reference distribution for the data, okay? And then we construct an ascent set around it. So there are two ascent sets. Now, so when we look at the, the DRO formulation, we want to make the, we want to choose the decision variable and then minimize the worst case. Now the worst case, the worst case is uh, this P distribution is, uh, now because building on a synergy, right? The, the identity set from the cloud, identity set from the edge. So now we look at the intersection between the two. So in this way, we make use of the knowledge. We learn from both the cloud and the edge. Make sense? Okay. So that's uh, the basic idea. So, okay, a different formulation could be the knowledge transfer from the cloud can be in terms of the prior distribution. Okay? Now, instead of, instead of like a modifying or with, you know, fine tuning, this is Einstein set around the, the data. Instead, we look at the, we can put constraints on the decision variable. So that's another way to formulate this, to make use of the knowledge from the cloud. OK. All right. So, so we talk about uh, construction of an set to model the knowledge transfer <coughs> from the cloud. Right? So, and, that, and the next key question would be, how do we construct it? So we look at the, you know, the Wasserstein board. Right? We, you know, we have the model from, from the cloud, say PC. We have the model from the edge, P0. How, how do we construct? What's the size of it? So the radius would determine that. Intuitively, if you are more confident in the knowledge you learn from the cloud, you should, uh, the radius should be larger or should it be smaller? Which one? Should it be larger? So if you, the radius is infinity, right? basically it doesn't tell you, doesn't give you constraint. That means you are not very confident in the cloud. So the smaller the radius, the more confident you are. Or in other words, if you are very confident in the knowledge transfer from the cloud, then the smaller radius you would set. The same for edge, right? If you are very confident in what you learn in the edge, the empirical model, you should set a smaller radius. Make sense? Yeah. So, um, so the question: How do we how do we choose what? Uh, how do we choose the the two radiuses? We have two Wasserstein boards corresponding to the two identity sets. Right. So how how should we choose um, how should we choose the radius? Okay. So for uh, the choice for the radius corresponding to the <coughs> Wasserstein ball at the edge, right? There is some there are some existing tools <coughs> we, can, we can make use of. So it really depends on the model, the local model, and also depends on the dimension uh, and the data sample size at the edge. Then there are some tools we can explore to, to determine. And then once you set the, the confidence level, then you can choose the you can determine the corresponding radius. So, but then the choice of the other one, right, the one, the knowledge transfer from the cloud, you will have a, we have constructed the Wasserstein board corresponding to that. How do we set and how do we determine the radius? So that uh, really depends, depends on the model between, between the relate, uh, Depend, it really depends on the <coughs> relationship between the cloud and the edge. Okay, uh, this is related to Bayesian learning. So, okay, let me present you a, a concrete formulation just to to get a, a some uh, more, more more deeper understanding of that. So, uh, in this formulation, we look at the uh, look at the the case we model. Basically, the knowledge transfer from the cloud is in terms of the data distribution and uh, the corresponding identity set. Here is modeled as uh, a Wasserstein ball. Okay, so this uh, first Wasserstein ball corresponds to, this P0 is the empirical one, empirical model at the edge. 
you construct one, one certain ball. And uh, this PC is from the cloud. Again, we construct an identity set, okay, one certain ball for that. So we have this DRO problem, distribution now, robust optimization problem. The difference, the new thing here is we have another constraint. It's not in, in this is based upon a knowledge transfer from the cloud. So how do we solve this? Right? We can use standard, we can use standard Lagrangian approach, the dual approach, we write this. So this is fairly standard. Now, see, we even look at the, the expression here. Uh, there are two Wasserstein distances. Okay. So it's very concise, but the computational can be very demanding. Why? Because uh, this Wasserstein distance depends on the joint structure between P1 and P2. Okay. So in learning problems, oftentimes the distribution is high dimension, say 10,000. If you look at the joint, it's 20,000. So computational is, is demanding. So here, is, you know, we tend to approach a so-called counter-rich duality formulation. So in, in, in uh, this tool developed by counter -rich, okay, so the Wasserstein and distance can be rewritten in terms of like, uh, you find this function phi. Now, you try to find this function phi that maximizes the sum of these two. Look at each term is integral with respect to P1, P2 only, marginal. P1, P2. So this really significantly reduce the computational complexity. Okay? Okay, this result actually was developed in the 70s, 1970s, and uh, it's uh, one of the main contributions by Kontovich. It won Nobel Prize in, in economics, partially because of that. So this has found a wide applications in machine learning. Okay, so now the problem reduces to characterizing this phi function, and this is the phi supersedes the conjugate function, okay? Now, using this tool, then we can do some tricks. This is, uh, you know, we said uh, there are two losses and distances, right? We set uh, this phi one, phi two in this form, and then we can work out the algebra, and uh, we can eventually, we will arrive here. Now it's become a, like a two-tier minimization problem. For that, we can, we can you know, we can write uh, <coughs> just numerical methods to, to solve it. Okay, let me skip the details in the interest of time. Okay, so come back to the question we talked about, uh, how do we set, how do we determine the radius corresponding to the Wasserstein boards? Because that uh, really tells us uh, how confident we are in the knowledge transfer from the cloud, how much, uh, how much confidence we have in the local, local learning, right? So uh, it really depends, okay, yeah. Um, so we have this uh, parameter we call it a cloud to edge competency ratio. Uh, we don't have, you know, we try to optimize it, but it turns out to be a long convex problem, which is difficult to solve. So for this, we don't have a, you know, theoretical result on that. So just to get an idea to, for illustration, uh, we look at this example, uh, logistic regression. Uh, we use this approach, uh, uh, DR approach to, to uh, enhance the performance to combine the computer synergy between the cloud and the edge. Okay, so so this is uh, just, quick just get a, a more complete idea. This is uh, the this corresponds to the edge only. You based on local data only, and if we combine the information, the knowledge transfer from from the cloud and from the edge, and then we can do better. That's the basic idea. I think I'm going to zip through this and uh, uh, talk about the. Uh, Collaborative learning between among edge nodes. So, any questions so far? I hope it makes sense. Okay. So, having talked about collaborative collaborative learning between edge and the cloud, right? And then next, we are going to look at the collaborative learning across edge nodes. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, this uh, study is uh, about learning when peers and learning from peers, okay? And this is based on a key observation that um, uh, many of the <coughs> learning tasks in the proximity, right, uh, they often share some kind of similarity. For instance, in smart manufacturing, <coughs> the robots in one um, manufacturing plant, right, they, they each of them has its own learning task, but the learning tasks have some, some similarities. Okay, so, 
So we look at this uh, problem, and the, the, you know, the basic setting is the following. Okay, the multiple edge nodes, each of them has a, its own learning task, but the, they share some similarity. Right? So we want to pre-train this and then transfer the knowledge to cloud, a new edge node, right? the target edge node, which has a new task to learn in real time. Okay? All right. So the question here is, uh, how do we do this, and uh, what kind of knowledge should we transfer to help the target edge node? Okay. So in existing approaches, okay, you know, many of you may have heard about the federated learning. Uh, so the idea behind federated learning is basically that many devices, okay, they try to, you know, learn one global model. One global model for for all nodes, okay, um, and uh, it's been shown the fine tuning performance. You know, when you apply this global model to a new node, to a new task, the performance is very limited. It's been shown. Okay, why? That's because you are trying to have one global model working for everybody. Right. That's just uh, too ambitious. And that applies to some settings, but uh, not always. In many cases, it doesn't work well. So another approach is to use so-called uh, <coughs> multi-task learning. So now in this, in this setting, there are multiple nodes, and each node has a task to learn, right? OK, so different model. And uh, the idea behind multi-task learning is to leverage computing resources, data, at other nodes, try to help to enhance your own learning. So this is done simultaneously, OK? And uh, this would require intensive computation, even for every node, right? So uh, this would be not be applicable to, the, to meet the latency requirement. Well, what am I looking at? All right. So very recently, there is a new approach uh, developed by a Berkeley group uh, called um, uh, MEMO, OK? Model Agnostic Meta Learning. So this is by Berkeley group. So the idea is that they want to pre-train, they want to train, pre-train a model in initialization, okay, across many tasks, many nodes. So you pre-train them by looking at the multiple, ta multiple tasks, so that you learn some, you learn the model in initialization when you apply to the new task, it can, you can apply fast adaptation, right, using just only a few samples at the new node, at the new task, you can quickly adapt to it and achieve good performance. That's called a um, uh, MIMO, okay, model agnostic um, meta learning. Okay, so this is done in a centralized manner, and also one there's one kind of strong assumption that requires all tasks follow same same long distribution. So when you learn, you try to draw samples from the distribution. So you model one, when you model one, the corresponding model would be, be drawn from this long distribution, okay? All right, so we try to get around these two assumptions. We try to relax this requirement. All tasks follow same distribution, same long distribution, and also we try to do it in a distributed manner. So combining the, the good ideas from these approaches, meta learning, federal <coughs> learning, multitask learning, we are developing this approach we call the federated meta learning. So we also want to train, pre-train a model initialization so it can be adapted to the new task very quickly. Okay, that's the idea. So pictorially, the idea behind this uh, meta learning is that, you know, if you have a global sort of hyperparameter, right? Yeah, and uh, if you learn that, then for new tasks, you can adapt to new, to new tasks very quickly using only a few samples. That's the idea for meta learning. All right. So just to recap, we want to uh, go beyond meta learning. We want to remove the assumption of this assumption of the same long task distribution. This, to me, to us, actually, is kind of strong. It may not be applicable to many scenarios. And uh, if we can do it, can, if we can implement the algorithm in a distributed manner, then we can have a good balance between communication cost and the computational cost. All right, so just to recap, we have this setting, the multiple edge nodes, source edge nodes, we want to pre-train, 
We only learn something about the model initialization. And then we transfer this meta knowledge to the edge, target edge node, and uh, uh, we can, then we can adapt quickly using a few local samples to learn <coughs> a new task. So that's the basic setting. All right. So mathematically, we have this formulation. Each uh, edge node has a, has a local database, and the corresponding to that is an uh, empirical risk function. That, okay, and then uh, depend, because uh, different nodes, different nodes may have different, uh, nodes, uh, may have a different uh, database with different distribution, different sizes. Right, we have this weighted <coughs> version for the global loss function. <coughs> okay, clear? So far so good? <coughs> All right. Okay, so the objective is to train, to pre-train a meta model that can be used to quickly adapt to the model we are trying to learn at the target node. Okay? So to do that, you know, we use this, uh, <coughs> we follow this meta learning approach. We use uh, basically a gradient approach. So this is from node i. Uh, this just use gradient update to get, uh, this is uh, theta is the global, sort of like a hyperparameter. And the phi i of theta is the local model parameter. So this is uh, just uh, a gradient adaptation to, uh, to get a local model. And we want to, overall, we want to minimize the global loss. Okay, this is the global loss is, uh, you see here, global loss depends on the testing data, and uh, this uh, adaptation is based on the training data. All right, I hope this is clear. And then we want to solve it in a distributed manner. All right, okay, so here's the uh, view graph, here's the view graph, view graph to illustrate the, 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 the procedure. So at each local edge node, it does update. So it has training data, has uh, testing data as well. Okay, so, and uh, to, it, to strike a good balance between communication cost and the computational cost, then this can be applicable to like a wireless setting. You know, the, the bandwidth in a wireless setting can be, can be limited. So uh, each local node can update can carry out can carry out an update every say over one communication round multiple times, and T zero is the in the number of uh, updates per communication round. So intuitively, if you update if you send an updates to the platform less often, and then the performance would degrade, right? Because uh, you know you, you know you don't up, you know don't have the sort of like a, a, the, the the most current information. Uh, to the to for the, for the global aggregation. <coughs> okay, so the global aggregation is done every T zero local updates. So this T zero is the number of updates per communication round. Okay, so and, uh, we can tune this parameter to, to strike a good balance between the communication cost and the computation cost. All right. Okay, and uh, once this meta training is <coughs> finished, and then we can apply this some criteria. And then we can use it for, uh, pre, this is pre-trained, right? And then we can apply it at the target node for fast adaptation. <coughs> okay, so for this um, model, then for this algorithm, we look at, we next we look at the convergence behavior. How good this, how fast can it converge and uh, how good is the uh, fast adaptation performance? Two, two questions. So we come up with the further with the meta learning algorithm so two key questions. We want to look at convergence behavior. We want to examine the fast adaptation performance. Okay. So the every proof requires some conditions. Uh, the first condition is basically, you know, first two conditions are very standard. Uh, basically, it requires the loss function to be convex and to be H smooth, kind of smoothness condition. And the third condition is about the hashing. Okay, which requires the hashing of uh, the, the, the loss function <coughs> to be raw Lipschitz. Okay, so basically this is uh, about how the smoothness and it gave us the idea of the landscape of local meta learning objective function. Okay, and the third assumption is actually this is something we impose. We try to replace this assumption that requires all tasks follow the same norm distribution. We try to remove that 
So we impose the condition basically tells requires give us a bond, give us bonds on the variation of gradients and the hessians of a local loss function. Okay, with respect to the hyperparameter theta. So, so we can regard this as the sort of like a first second order conditions to replace the assumption. This is more general. Instead of imposing one common assumption, right, requiring one common distribution for all tasks, we just impose like a, in terms of gradients, in terms of um, uh, hashing. Okay. So when this condition, then we can first characterize the behavior of this uh, global loss function is convex, is smooth, and next we can bound the dis dissimilarity across uh, local learning tasks. So this is the global one, this is the local one for node i. See, <coughs> the, the gradient, right, it gives us the uh, idea of the smoothness. So with these two results, that's the sort of like a main result on convergence. So if this uh, theta star is the underlying one, okay, the underlying model for meta, for the meta knowledge. And the theta t is, you know, we're looking at a t, right, real time energy intelligence, so t, so 100 times, 100 iterations, 200 iterations, 500 iterations. <coughs> so after these t iterations, what do you get, right? So the gap, because of the light structure of the loss function we impose, so we're here, we're looking at the loss gap, gap in terms of uh, the loss function. It can be translated to the gap between theta t and the theta star. Okay. So basically here, this result tells us under these conditions, uh, the gap between the loss, right, and the, you know, if we use, had to use the, 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 the underlying one, is upper bounded by one over t, so it's kind of like conventional one over t, and then there are some other parameters here, which uh, is, are kind of tedious, but the idea is that this term basically tells us uh, the convergence, convergence error would decrease node wind, node similarity. Yeah, I, I wrap up in you know, five, ten, at the most ten minutes. Okay, all right. Okay, I try to. Okay, zip through this. Okay, so yeah, and uh, also it would the error would increase when t zero because uh, the less frequent you communicate, each local node communicates with the platform, and then the sort of like the information is in the, is not as a fresh, right? That's why the performance will degrade a little bit here. Okay, so then we look at the fast adaptation performance. Again, we have this bound. Okay, so suppose we're, you know, the meta model, the underlying one is theta c star, and uh, the output of our algorithm is theta c. And the previous result we know is bounded by some term, let's say, it's denoted by theta uh, epsilon c. And then we look at the fast adaptation performance. Okay, so that the, the target as you know, we, this is the corresponding uh, loss, okay? And uh, this is what we get, and this is the underlying one, suppose, and then we can bound the performance, again, in terms of loss function. This is uh, what we get, this fast adaptation, with fast adaptation, this is the underlying one. And it can be bounded by a scaled version of this uh, surrogate difference between this term theta t star and the theta c star. Basically, this tells us the similarity between the target edge node and uh, the source edge nodes. So, you know, I'm sorry I have to uh, go through this very quickly, but if you're interested in the details, we can talk offline. All right, we also look at the robust version because uh, the meta learning can be available to adversarial attacks. So the idea is that for each local cost, we get one more term. This is based on DRO. So basically, this DRO represents the perturbation, adversarial perturbation, right? Suppose uh, adversarial injects adversarial data to this data set. And then uh, we can pre-train each node to learn how to protect against that, okay? So then through this, then the model would uh, gain the capability to combat against future adversarial attacks without losing too much uh, accurate performance. So that's the idea behind. All right, so again, we have done some uh, theoretical studies, and this is uh, based on another recent result on water stand distance. Uh, uh, so I'm going to maybe 
the idea here is that um, uh, so we use a Lagrangian like, relaxation, and this uh, based on this beautiful result actually. This uh, uh, we can show uh, this can be this Lagrangian like, this this original perturbation problem here. Okay, can be translated. It can be cast as you know equivalent problem. Okay, so we try to uh, look at this problem instead. Let me just uh, summarize this uh, approach. Okay, so okay, so the robust federal meta learning is uh, this is cast as this new problem, right? Okay. And uh, this PI is the empirical model, empirical model, which can data based upon clean data and also the best of data. Okay, so uh, for this, we also study the convergence behavior and uh, under some conditions, we show the, this problem uh, as a unique solution. So <coughs> the point here is that, you know, if uh, uh, the linear weight is small and if uh, we can sacrifice a little bit of robustness, and then we can uh, achieve robustness. And we can achieve, we can still achieve a good performance with the reasonable accuracy. All right, so some of you experimental results. Should I go through this or? Have one minute. One minute? I okay, what. I know as time is running out. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so we have a, Run experiments uh, using uh, uh, synthetic data, using MNIST data, and the real world data, and using Twitter data. And you see the size actually is uh, quite large. And uh, just to get an idea of the performance uh, of this federated machine meta learning approach, so we first look at the impact of node similarity. You see that the node similarity decreases, the performance will degrade. And then uh, we look at the communication cost. If we increase, T is the same. The number of iterations, T is the same. If we increase number of updates per communication round, the performance <coughs> would also degrade. We also examine the performance in non comic setting. You see the performance is still reasonably good. All right. I will look at, then look at the impact of uh, target source similarity. And, uh, okay. So I guess uh, just, uh, it just achieves good performance. And uh, you take my words for that. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So just to summarize, we look at the, the IoT ecosystem, we view it as a <coughs> cloud edge continuum. Um, so there are many open problems. Here, what I present here is just uh, touching the tip of the iceberg. I raise actually more questions than what we have answered. Okay? So the idea, or what our, what our belief is that it will, for to, to achieve real time edge intelligence, it will requires collaborative learning between cloud and the edge and the cross edge nodes. So I'll conclude here. Thank you so much. So before I ask for questions, those of you who need a password, the password for today is uh, great. Great. <laughs> great too. So any question? <coughs> great. G-R-E-A-T. Lower case, all lower. So let me ask you a question. So these models, so you need to communicate these models between the agent cloud or vice versa, right? So what kind of communication we're talking about? How much, like how many bits you need? What what is the kind of uh, a scale of uh, communication? That you need? So, very good question. The question is about the communication cost between <laughs> cloud and the edge when we look at the collaborative learning between the two. <coughs> so, in our formulation here, uh, this is just a one transfer. There's no communication needed for the collaborative learning between edge and the cloud. That's the sort of like a, the uh, beauty of this formulation. Let me go back to the formulation here. <coughs> So, so the cloud has a lot of resources, a lot of data. It can run offline. And then you learn something in terms of knowledge. And we don't want to transmit data, right? So what we do here is we trans transmit the knowledge 
in terms of for this model, say you learn PC and then you construct a water sample and you just pass that to the edge. That's it. In this case. <coughs> you need to send a distribution. Yeah. But you can send it offline, right? You can send it offline. Because you learn offline. So you can send it offline. It uh, can be high dimensional distribution. So in fact, this is what is done in Google's Edge TVU. So Google's Edge TVU, you learn a new network model, you just pass the whole thing, you can download the whole thing. And the way, in fact, what it does, if you want to retrain, it peels off the last layer. So that is kind of like a constructing ICD, ICD set around it. That's how they do it. They, do, they don't have this interpretation. They are listening to the answer, so please, uh, if you want to speak, go up. So any other question? Yes. Um, so basically, uh, obviously, the performance of uh, your approach depends on how good your approximation is for P0 and you right. use any um, a specific parametric approximation? Because I, in one study, I saw that you you mentioned you are going to use GAN for further your, yes. your future work. But for this one, you, um, what kind of approximation did you use for? So good question about uh, how do you weigh, what's the sort of like a, what are what are the roles of P0 and PC? So P0 is just an empirical distribution based on local data. That's something already, you know, whatever data you have, you construct it. But you need to construct an isolated set or construct a water sample around it. The radius, how big an isolated set it is, right? and that, that's what it matters. It's not P0, it's the isolated set around it that it matters. Same for this, uh, the other one. So P0 is what you learn in the cloud, because the cloud has so much data, so much computational resources, right? It can learn PC with no problem. But then when you transfer, it's not 100% applicable to the edge. Oftentimes, what you learn in other places, right? You can transfer, you can learn something, but it's not 100% applicable to what you are trying to do at the edge. Make sense? Yeah. So then, how do we do the transfer? How do we model it? We use a water stand ball around it, around its PC. And how big this ball is, that's what matters. That's what determines, right? If you are very confident in PC, then you choose eta 2, this radius, for the water stand ball to be very small, because you, you know you can find the search to be within this, this smaller one, smaller ball. So that's the idea. Thank you. Yes. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in your analysis, you bound the gap between the local model and the global model. In terms of yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a worst case bound, right? And yeah. I, I'm wondering what happens when the number of edge nodes grows. That bounds become, becomes really bad, no? So that bound, that's great, very key point. So here we are looking at this sort of like a generic setting, and we assume this gap is for all edge nodes. When the number of the you know, it grows, right, and then this is another hole, right? So the setting we are, can, we are looking at is uh, maybe there are many nodes, but not, there are not too many nodes. And uh, in, the, in the case, there are many, too, many, many nodes, right, many, many edge nodes. And then somehow we have to, in, we can impose, uh, we have to modify this condition to make, uh, make the, the condition hold. Yeah, we can talk more, and this yeah. is something we can, we would be interested in exploring further. Next. Any other question? Okay, then let's thank the speaker.